my talk's going to be quite different from the rest. Um, and uh, I'm going to touch on some of the topics that other people have as well, but in a sort of really quite different way. And um, I think when Mike asked me to tackle this topic, imagining a socialist society, I mean, how wide open is that? Um, I think he was hoping for a somewhat optimistic approach, you know, so we could all go home after the weekend feeling a little bit <laughs> lifted, if nothing else. So I hope you won't disappoint, I hope you won't be disappointed. Where are you, Mike? He's left already. Okay. <laughs> so imagining a socialist society. Well, before I could begin to tackle that, I really first had to ask myself, what is society now? And to have a starting point, a jumping off block, my first hastily scribbled ideas about society now went something like this. Society is generally recognised as being a group of people who live together in some kind of ordered community, and which I perceive to have been ordered, conditioned over the years to fit the requirements of the ruling elites and their lackeys. But apart from the more or less formal, legitimate societies, there are many other different kinds of societies or substrata of society which find themselves outside the realms of normality, still having one way or another to meet the basic requirements, but whose conditions manifest themselves in a host of different ways. For example, landless peasants who have to scratch a living as and where they can. Societies from which people, especially children and women, are sold and trafficked for work, sex and servitude. Elderly folk in both the underdeveloped and the overdeveloped world, stuck in perpetual employment because of shrinking pension, no pension or no savings. Single parent families, mostly mothers, struggling by begging or on part-time work or benefits or both. The underemployed and the overemployed but underpaid. And let's not forget all those other workers worldwide who reach a certain level of comfort, who must be consumers, must be, because that's part of the conditioning. Those who followed the natural progression held by capitalism. The millions we hear about who have been lifted out of poverty in China, many of them to return to it in short order after the recent economic collapse. And the burgeoning middle class in India. Hooray for the corporations. Yet pretty well all of my thoughts went about current day society went down this cynical, negative road. And I admit it, because it's pretty obvious that so much of worldwide population just doesn't fit into any generally held concept of society. But the danger of focusing on aspects like this for a lot of people is that it becomes too easy to switch off. Mm -hmm. To put it out of their minds, to become passive and accept no responsibility because they didn't want it to be like this. They personally didn't cause it to be so. It's always been like this, and it'll always be like this. Now, we may be well aware of the various states of working men and women and children worldwide, and also be cognizant of the fact that many, many workers feel they've neither time in their lives, space in their heads, nor freedom from oppression to apply themselves to discovering the reasons for their state, let alone believe they can have any positive effect in changing their circumstances. But we know that human development means much more than joining the ranks of the consummate consumers, which itself really is just another form of enslavement and control, and also one which takes no heed of the health, safety, and well-being of workers, or the health and long-term viability of our one and only environment. However, if we are bereft of hope, there's no way we can be begin to envisage a socialist society. If we didn't believe it were possible to overturn capitalism at some time and realize our objectives, would we even be here now? Our philosophy is surely one which also embraces hope. I believe it has to. Our goal is to reach a level of human intellectual development, a level of awareness whereby the working class now totally alienated from the fruits of their labour, become the conscious instigators of their self-determined new societies. Cooperative, inclusive, and deliberately conceived to encourage all to, re to reach their true potential in whatever areas they choose. So, 
moving on from where we're at now, moving from where we're at now, regarding the possibility of whether and under what circumstances socialism could replace capitalism, Marx wrote of two prerequisites, very simply put. One, a clear understanding of socialist principles with an unambiguous desire to put them into practice. And two, an advanced industrial economy so that free access is technically possible. Well, as far as the latter is concerned, I think there's a broad consensus that there's no problem that couldn't be dealt with now once we've collectively linked the former. The political ignorance of many of the working class has to be a major challenge. For this reason, as far as any necessary uh, transition period or transitional society is concerned, I believe that now is the time we should consider, consider to be the crucial stage. Science and technology, scientists, technologists, technicians, call them what you will, they have in their hands the knowledge and the wherewithal to take humanity in any direction it chooses to take. But like the rest of us, they are constrained by the system we live in. They aren't directed by the wishes, the needs and aims of society as a whole, but have to follow, follow the logic of their master, the market. Everything becomes possible when the tools are in the right hands, the hands of the producers. It becomes a matter of organisation to bring about a new society. This is what I would refer to as the transition. There's plenty of work left to be done to achieve the satisfaction of everyone's basic which is currently deliberately <coughs> left undone as the profit motive dictates. It's a fundamental shift of emphasis away from the dictates of a small minority to the wishes and needs of the overwhelming majority, requiring majority populations worldwide to capture the state operators politically in order to restructure it according to their plan. A plan of a totally democratic system from whose broad as possible base decisions will pass through the structure, representing the widest possible views. Once the motivation for cronyism and corruption is removed by material, the best groups of people, and I say that best in terms of most fitted to whatever the particular task, then they could be occupied for the common good in all areas. This bottom-up, proactive, protagonist democracy would be used at all levels, local, regional, world. And I find it difficult to find other expressions away from the hierarchical ones that we're used to, we're so bound up in. But really my idea here is just a logistical one. Um, but the pyramid definitely has its power at the base, with delegates selected to carry forward the message and speak for the whole community. To attain the stage where the full development of creative human potential is widely recognised as being the goal of life for we human beings, this is the change we need. Not achieving parity or possessions, <coughs> or even getting out of hunger, getting out of poverty or, or beating hunger. We have to have a vision far beyond the stage, see beyond the intellectual paucity that drives current day society to crave the material above the cerebral or philosophical, favouring or craving things above thoughts and ideas. Ending poverty, hunger, treatable diseases, enabling all to have an adequate living conditions, all this goes without saying. These goals are all part of what is to be achieved in the transitionary period and would be planned for in full consultation with local communities. I believe the time for the necessary transition is long overdue, and, but I believe the toughest task is in aware, awareness and fostering social, socialist consciousness. Well, as there isn't really time here to address the many questions about in which countries or which sections of society we may look to be seeing signs of working class acting as though they had a collective objective of overturning the current system, where the germ of an idea of that socialism may sprout first or most forcefully, I'm working from a wild assumption just for convenience <coughs> that it will strengthen more or less simultaneously around the world. Please don't challenge me on that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, you could sound sidestepping the issue, but if I were to try and address it 
firstly now. I'd never get to the, the main thing on my brief, that's what that's about, for my excuse. <laughs> anyway, once decided democratically that we are heading for a socialist world, it becomes a much simpler matter. Quite how it will happen is open to conjecture. Depriving the capitalist class of the state and its functionaries is the first objective. Decision made, it becomes a matter of organisation. Suffice it to say, there would have been a period of planning and co uh, coordination by mass organisations in workplaces, in neighbourhoods, in educational establishments, <laughs> in organisations with international links, in civic organisations, and they'll culminate in the collective protagonist decision of the people to take control of the direction of their lives immediately and for the future. The decision to turn their backs on the system that's failed them over and over in favour of the one for which they are ready to work to make happen, ready to work for to continue its progress, and which will work for them and not against them. With ever increasing numbers, discussion and debate would have begun to determine the direction of the path to be taken. These mass organisations were also increasingly attractive members of what are now coercive forces, police, security and armed forces as more of them joined the ranks of the other workers, recognising their true affiliation. All over the world are dissident groups from the armed forces. To name just three, the US, UK and Israel have got, um, you know, in their armed forces and police forces too, who they are habitually refused a public platform to broadcast their news, views and truths, because they're too damaging to the status quo but whose associations put up websites and blog sites and get information out to growing members of society who are seeking truth and transparency. And as print and broadcast media becomes more and more controlled, or self-controlling, giving only the angle that suits the establishment, the power of the internet will be a driving force, attracting those whose voices can't be heard through commercial channels, enabling the working class to share the facts on the ground to build support and to attract those who are becoming, or already are, antagonistic to the capitalist systems. We can expect the activists to be always one step ahead of the establishment forging ahead, mm -hmm. making new links where others are taken down. Now what about the work situation? Here's a few ideas for consideration. There's much work done today, both formally and informally, which we need to continue. The work that's socially useful now, whether recognised as legal or informal or black market, will continue to be useful. There'll be no antagonisms or fissures in society caused by protectionism or disagreement about who's taking whose work. The change will be that of ownership. Everything will be owned in common, and the best people to organise the running and functioning of workplaces will be those who understand and have experience in their particular discipline. In other words, the people who do the work now, but who will have become free from former constraints and able to determine different goals and outcomes. Decision making will be focused on benefits to society in general. Economy will relate to use of materials and reduction of waste. Doing and thinking, heads and hands, will both be vital components in the socialist system. And as socialist consciousness will have grown to the point of enabling the change, so too the understanding and acceptance that all contributors to our new society are valuable. What are currently perceived as inequalities by some, but as earned rights by others, i.e. difference in pay scale, bonuses, holiday entitlement, pensions, etc., must be viewed quite differently. As we would wish to have our contributions recognised as worthy, so too will we value the wide-ranging contributions of others. All work that's paid now, that is considered useful and beneficial to society, will continue. Those now unemployed or underemployed will be welcomed into the world of free association as extra hands and heads. Likewise, work that is now undertaken voluntarily will continue to be useful and advantageous. 
The voluntary sector will bring forward many who already have well-developed social consciousness, previously having recognised the inequalities in society and the lack of access or opportunity afforded to others. Voluntary work, after all, is just another mode of occupation which currently fills many gaps deliber deliberately left unfilled <coughs> because they are a burden on the economy, where people are left needy according to the whims of the market and are rescued to some degree from their difficulty by people working for the common good. What will become redundant, because unnecessary in our society of free association, will be the damaging parasitical elements of current employment opportunities. In a world of voluntary work and free access, a sizable portion of the worldwide population will be freed up from spurious pseudo-work, work that contributes nothing necessary, positive, useful or aesthetic to society. Work which simply moves money around, or protects money and the moving of money around, or incarcerates those who choose to defy the rules of the system by helping themselves to what, in the capitalist system, is perceived to, is perceived to be against societal norms. Instead, they'll have the opportunity to contribute positively to the aspirations of society as a whole. We can't simply denigrate those who work in these areas for doing so now. They too need employment in today's system. And they are merely doing what they have been groomed to do to fit into a niche designed, desire, designed to be desirable and necessary. But what a huge number of individuals will be released from what we look back on as an era of useless, worthless bondage to money. Released to be themselves, to become useful, valued members of their communities to which they can now add real value. Which actually brings me to consider waste. Waste. Waste of labour power. Waste of resources. Waste of time. Waste of potential. There is so much unnecessary waste. One of our aims will surely be to eliminate waste of all kinds. Current waste levels, acceptable, even necessary to an extent in capitalism, can be turned on their head in a socialist society, which would redirect labour to useful, productive and creative occupation. All use and reuse of materials will be carefully assessed as to their most advantageous and least harmful outcomes. Work in general will be carried out in comfortable, healthy environments using the most appropriate technology, where it's a positive requirement. Always with the opportunity and options for creative work left open. Being antagonistic to the requirement of growth per se, societies will be aiming for conservation and to the achievement of a steady state with a philosophy of do no harm to animal, vegetable or mineral. Quality goods will replace the obsolescence culture and whole new looks at transport, energy and infrastructure will bring about a truly sustainable approach. Fulfillment of individual goals other than consumption, development of the wider human faculties and societies working together for common, social and environmental benefits will be the modus operandi. This, in very, very simple terms, is part of Marx's association in which the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all. And also, according to Marx, socialism is solely a question of planning and organisation in which producers do not exchange their products. Well, I interpret this as all of us involved in voluntary social work following a plan or plans that have been endorsed by, well, most of us. And we will acknowledge the free association of producers, facilitators, transporters, administrators, caterers, carers, trainers, artists, educators, cleaners, entertainers, engineers, etc., 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 all as necessary in this thankful cogs in the wheel. We will each play our part in keeping it turning and oil for the benefit of all. 
And although we will all participate in the work to be done, we shall presumably see many changes in the structure and demographics of work. One very simple example. Just look at rush hour traffic around any large town anywhere in the world. Thousands of cars rushing, or more likely crawling, to get to their destinations. Most with sole occupants. Travelling many miles in opposite directions in the morning, and still travelling many miles in opposite directions in the evening, on return. Now, does a plumber or an installer of alarms <coughs> really have to travel several hours to do useful work? Isn't it possible that someone on the doorstep can perform such a function? Actually, will we need any alarms to be installed anyway? <laughs> Maybe fire alarms and uh, other life-saving or life-enhancing systems, yes, okay. But it's the crazy job market that dictates where and how far people will travel. Imagine how much more efficient the whole caboodle will be in socialism. Massive human energy savings by vastly reducing travel miles and fuel and emission savings while we work on reducing those speedily to as close to nil as possible. How much more pleasant and rewarding the whole work experience will become with easy access to the workplace, meaning a less stressful day for a start and a finish. With a fully integrated public transport system in place, cities could be restored, converted, transformed even, to be places in which it would be pleasant to live, clean, with expansive green areas, woods, communal gardens, even agricultural areas. Gone will be the inglorious mix of slums and gated communities. Cities will become places worthy of living in when we stop seeking answers in money terms for every single thing and giving back people the ownership of their communities and substituted the attitude of the best outcomes for people and planet in every situation. The policies over the last few decades, which have resulted in the demographics of rural and urban communities being totally changed, making it impossible for many to make a living in the rural areas and coercing them into sick and continuing poverty, can be overturned with the will of the people. And when much of urban work will have become redundant, society as a whole will be free to choose the kinds of environments they wish to live in. In many parts of the world, there will be a huge, voluntary shift back to the land, creating thriving, coherent communities with localised services. Short-termism and consumerism, as we've come to know them, will be replaced by an understanding of the consequences of ignoring externalities. Capitalist corporations now largely ignore externalities. They don't factor the negatives into their equations. Cleaning up their mess whether in air, ground, or water, robs them of their profits. These costs in human health and environmental problems are not their concern. Individuals being captive of the current system are almost powerless to be in any way effective against this mighty machine. Whether adding hourly to the ever-mounting mountains of plastic waste or depriving other communities of their potable water to be persuaded that bottled water is best, or propping up child labour for the purchase of shoes and clothing, or simply putting petrol in the car. The system pretty well dictates what our choices must be. What a much simpler life we could have with this bizarre third element removed from all equations. Why complicate what could be a perfectly simple arrangement? Whenever I let my mind run freely on this topic, which I do often, I find myself pondering this use of a third element. A third element that only confuses and complicates. Take, take for instance, this project I read about recently, to plant trees on a massive scale worldwide, to prevent soil erosion, to sequester carbon for water retention, to meet the need for fuel, wood, that sort of thing. What is taken into account is the monetary cost of billions of seedlings, the monetary cost of mobilizing hundreds of thousands of people to do the work, and the monetary cost of paying people not to farm where the land is erodible, where many of the trees will be planted. 
and the total was calculated in billions of dollars. Now you could say the outcomes would be beneficial for many people, ensuring the continuance of farming, better air quality, reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere, preservation of water tables, all those kind of things. But surely the simplest and easiest solution, if we recognise that it's advisable to plant such numbers of trees, is to mobilise people to collect seeds and grow them on, to take cuttings to strike and plant them on. But we need to know when and how many people to mobilise in which areas and how many tools will be needed to be supplied. These are the numbers we need to count. People working in their local communities for the benefit of all. The benefit of all. Recognising that everyone can't have direct access to the best soil, but that all can share the produce from it, and also share the indirect benefits of the tree planting initiative. It's this middle element, money, and the problems arising from it that prove to be such a difficult concept for the working class as a whole. In any transaction, and at each and every exchange, it's what's given to and taken from, i.e. money, that is essential in the capitalist system, but absolutely superfluous to what's needed, needed in a system built on society's needs. What we must get folk to see is that if I work, and you work, and everyone else works, without of money, what will change is there'll be, there'll be no extraction of profit via the surplus labour, because all of the labour will be voluntary contributed. All products and services from our shared labour will benefit the new society as a whole through our system of common ownership and free access. As far as buying and selling is concerned, this exchange will be redundant when we willingly share our common assets, our head and our hands. What a relief it will be! I've got a few more thoughts on how various other areas of our lives will be affected by this very different cost calculation of meeting human needs. Now, I, I must take some account of the uh, prospect of and estimates of likely changes in the near future as a result of climate change and a post, um, a post peak oil world society. To ignore it, for the convenience of an easier approach I, I, of imagining a socialist society, I think will be irresponsible, unrealistic and ultra-utopian as well. So the subject, let the subject of peak oil to begin. I don't think we can deny there's pretty well a consensus now, worldwide, that we have a mountain problem on our hands and a marathon task ahead to sort out the problem. However, the biggest stumbling block is the manner in which the subject is presented to us, again, always in terms of money costs. We already have the technical know-how, and when scientists and technicians and engineers are finally freed from the constraints of the current system of having to make a profit at every step, there really is no doubt that they can come up with even more fantastic inventions than we can currently dream about. The solutions we are being offered are lacklustre, extremely limited, and they only take into account those who can pay. Okay. Are we drilling for oil and gas and mining for coal because of the, the positive benefits they confer? Are we building more and wider roads and increasing <coughs> air travel for increased ease and convenience of travellers? Are we chopping down forests to plant palm plantations and using other crops for biofuels instead of for food because feeding engines is more important than feeding people? No. No. The reason we're trying to extract oil from way under the seabed with all those risks involved in the environment and from the um, filthy polluting tar sands is simply that it's profitable. Coal is even more harmful to human health, but still profitable. Burning fossil fuels some little time yet, with the various beneficiaries wheeling and dealing about the most profitable ways to prolong the destruction of the planet and the negative effects to human health. But our approach would turn theirs on its head. We know we have much better methods already in our hands, and hosts of people just chomping at the bit to get started in putting these new technologies into practice on a very large scale at the household and industrial level. Many would have chosen to do it years ago if it weren't for the prohibitive monetary cost. 
clean electricity from sun, wind, wave and tides, geothermal energy, oil left in the ground or reserved for crucial manufacturing and extracted with care, buildings constructed to use mineral energy and have minimal impact on the environment. Same with transport. What we need is less, not more. A system that doesn't need every household to have two or more cars because the public transport system is so abysmal and work arrangements chaotically organised. Read, organise to maximise profit, not maximise use of labour. Roads and airways are not the most efficient way of moving either people or goods. Presently, they are huge polluters and the bane of many people's lives. We were taking a holistic approach. We could use clean electricity from renewable sources to provide an integrated transport system for people, products and industry. Recycling would be undertaken as a matter of course in every possible area. Materials being our storehouse for the future, they will be valued for their worth to our ongoing well-being. They won't be wasted by an obsolescence mentality, but used wisely, aesthetically and carefully in line with our philosophy. Externalities, the negative aspects of transactions which have to be kept off the balance sheets in case they impact on profit margins, effluent in waterways, emissions dangerous to animal and plant life, the dumping of toxic waste on land and in the sea, any despoilation of our habitat and disregard for the conditions in which people live and work in relation to these externalities will become an integral part of our planning equation to be taken account of in full on the balance sheet of the common good. Regarding biofuels, presumably meant to be a leaning towards appeasing greens or environmentalists, whatever targets governments have set for replacing a percentage of fossil fuels with biofuels, they are misguided or simply misdirected or should I say lied to by those with ulterior motives. Europe, but well, certainly the UK, does not have the required growing space for the amount of crops necessary for their stated targets of biofuels. If they were planning instead to buy them from elsewhere, it would require one of two changes in the targeted area. Both would have negative effects on at least some of the incumbents. First, either virgin land, probably forested area, would have to be cleared with the ramifications of increased emissions, soil erosion, reduced carbon sequestration, and the forced removal of indigenous people. Or second, land already used for growing food would have to be diverted for growing this other crop, probably putting small farmers or pastures of their traditional lands and the uh, growing area. Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, brought tens of thousands of delegates together recently in Copacabamba to discuss a proposal for a better way forward for humankind in general than had been proposed in Copenhagen last December. Representative of many indigenous peoples he talked of the imperative of protecting and respecting Mother Earth. Now, the society we are familiar with may be far removed from expressing itself in such a way, but I believe we can empathise with the intent behind this statement. This planet is our natural environment. It is where we evolved. We are of it. We are nourished by it. It provides for our needs. Protecting the planet our sole environment is a simple philosophy. I don't foul my patch, so why would I foul yours or you mine? Mm -hmm. What could be a simpler way? Of course, it doesn't work like that now, mm -hmm. because too many are caught up with the idea of making an easy buck. Well, that's too complicated for me. Yeah. Now, regarding water, food, and farming in general, the first point to make is that farming methods will be adopted according to health benefits, not wealth benefits, and satisfying genuine hunger and not hunger for profits. For instance, 
How will the current water inequalities be resolved around the world? Water is vital to all life. It's vital to agriculture, to manufacturing, and it's needed in both urban and rural environments. And right now, agriculture is losing the price war for water. I've got a couple of examples here. The price of water delivered from farms in 13,000 tankers daily, as of a few months ago, into the city of Chennai, that's the old Madras. Uh, far exceeds the money value of the crops that can be grown using the same value of water. So crops like wheat, rice, and corn require huge water and put something like a thousand tons of water to grow a ton of wheat. So it, they, they, farmers can make more money tankering the water into the towns and selling it rather than growing their, whatever their crops are there. In the US, cities are buying water rights from farmers for the same reason. In California, between 1997 and 2007, the irrigated area fell by 10% because they were selling water into the cities. You have to think about ramifications for the agriculture. On an international scale, we now find that countries making deals with other countries to grow the whole or the bulk of their grain crop because the water they save by not growing domestically is more profitable used elsewhere. And for other countries, all, if, they, if they get another third party country to grow their crops for them, um, their own water shortage problem is already, and it doesn't matter if the local population of the grower nation have to go short, or be put off their land and out of their homes, it's exchange. One way or another, there's a huge wastage of water with current irrigation methods, poor infrastructure, old or outdated technology in some industries, money-based equations in water use for mining, uh, a billion dollar business selling bottled water at up to a thousand times the cost of water from the tap, mm. and how many thousands of gallons mm. of water are wasted in the process? Crazy. With shrinking aquifers and glaciers and fertile land sinking below rising sea levels, water is seen only as a vital resource with an ever-increasing price tag. With the profit motive removed from the equation, things will be managed very differently. In the likely future scenario, demographics will probably change a great deal. More on that in a moment. But we should be in a position to totally rethink the use of the global water supply and consider every stage from aquifers, dams, irrigation methods, industrial use, and domestic consumption. Water and the infrastructure required will be considered in minute detail as to how best to use, reuse, conserve, and generally value it as a basic necessity of all life, one of everyone's fundamental requirements. Also, within agriculture, we should be reassessing the relative values of different methods of producing our food. We should be free to look at the results of studies knowing <coughs> that there's no hidden agenda or biased information. It's well known that the United Nations Millennium Goal of reducing extreme poverty in half by 2015 is failing miserably. Hunger, illiteracy and disease are still growing year on year. That actually is acceptable poverty, or tolerable poverty anyway, Poverty at any level is pretty grim, surely. And why has this goal failed? Because of the false value placed on different people's contribution to their community, their society. When we have the correct, ambiguous facts in front of us, decisions can be made unemotionally about land use. Chemical fertilizer or natural manure and traditional methods. Monocrops or mixed farms. Grain for food or fuel. Grain for humans or animals. Mm. What's so important about grain? Well, it depends on how you see the future. It depends on whether you consider it more important to use it for <coughs> human food, for animal food, or for transport fuel. It impacts on how you view population forecasts or global warming warnings. And it depends to a certain extent on where you live in the world. For instance, at the United States level, a 
800 kilograms of consumption of grain per person per annum, 800 kilograms per person per annum, the world grain harvest would support two and a half billion people. At the Italian level, of 400 kilograms per person per annum, five billion people. At the Indian level, of 200 kilograms per person per annum, 10 billion people. And this impacts significantly on water use too. Let's say that US citizens decided to eat a bit less meat. Grain use could reduce significantly by consuming 100 kilograms or less, so 700 kilograms instead of 800, then 30 million tonnes less wheat would be needed, reducing water use by 30 billion tonnes, whilst also re reducing emissions by raising less cattle. That's economy. Surely it makes more sense in general to reduce food miles. Who did I hear say that this morning? To relocalise agriculture for everyone's benefit. By doing so, Huge savings will be made in fuel and energy use. Certainly in the transition period, whilst we're investing our human energies into appropriate infrastructure, we can cut emissions drastically and restore sovereignty and food security to local communities. Always remembering decisions will be made locally. On the global scale, we will move right away from decisions imposed and implemented by world authorities and transnational corporations in favour of working for the common good. Respect will automatically confer to local knowledge and traditional methods, understanding that the objective will be to satisfy food, fibre, fuel and other needs, not monetary goals. I hope I've got a few minutes left to touch briefly on what's a really a massive subject for discussion, health, education and general well-being. In brief, life without healthcare budgets, waiting lists made history, no treatment denial, access to healthcare from prenatal to death, preventive medicine recognised as the core of a healthy society. Known cures for such as malaria available universally. Unencumbered research into cures for diseases like multiple sclerosis. Unhampered individual choice and access to contraception, abortion, rehabilitation therapy, respite care and assisted suicide, whatever. Basic schooling to take a huge shift away from the narrow confines of a rigid test-based curriculum. <clears throat> Endless possibilities should be available from early age to stimulate children. No financial budget means more educators, facilitators, trainers, coaches, etc. to guide young and old through a much wider educational experience. Learning is far better stimulated than holistic and experiential approach. There's one proven positive knock-on effect of uh, education for girls, especially as recorded in places such as Pakistan, Afghanistan, and some of the African countries, is that in communities where the girls have the opportunity and encouragement to go to school, they actually grow up to marry later, they have less children, and the numbers of both maternal and infant deaths decline. Statistics also show that more stable family conditions, i.e. especially security of food and often income too, raises people to a different level of security where it isn't seen as linked to a, a huge brood of children. Hence, the security of free access in a socialist society will fulfil that role. In these terms, it's possible to see that populations will decline because of mass conscious choice, relieving some of the pressures foreseen as a result climate change. Other manufactured fears or perceived threats like concern about immigrants which leads to xenophobia and nationalism will also become a thing of the past 
as people perceive their relationship with others in a totally different way. They will have become more aware, in general and in particular, of how they impact on each other through the mode of production and distribution, having discovered cooperation to be preferable in every way to competition. Universal education can only raise levels in all areas important to the well-being of society, whether knowledge, awareness, tolerance, capabilities, wider appreciation of self and others, resulting in wealth being measured in human terms. In conclusion, I, I realise and I accept that I have left many areas, many issues untouched. Deciding on what to put in and what to leave out wasn't an easy decision. But to wind up, imagining a socialist society. I imagine many pluralist, cooperative, non-competitive, non-combative societies around the world, linked by their common goals of creating space for free thought, wider vision, acceptance of the other, and tolerance, tolerance of minority issues. I imagine a balance between back to nature and into the future boldly, philosophically embracing both healthy body and healthy inquiring mind. The process of developing this, the only viable alternative society, will come from the local and the familiar at community level from all the many diverse regions of the world, as all are recognized and welcomed into the free association as viable parts of the whole. I imagine societies of individuals having vanquished the oppressive capital system at last and having satisfied basic needs, now conscious of their higher human faculties and aware of their role in the environment, focused on being all that they can be. My final word is one of belief. If we know our aims to be worthwhile and in the best possible interest of life and planet, why wouldn't we want to get out there and contribute positively to making it happen, whatever the odds? I have an idea. And that's it. Thank you.